I was the overall commander, and I and I alone bear full military responsibility for what happened at Abbey Gate. Failure to plan for their withdrawal threatened the safety and security of U.S. personnel. The outcome in Afghanistan was the cumulative effect of many decisions over many years of war. I'd like to talk a little bit now about Abbey Gate. It was a tragic event, one of many that have occurred over our 20-year engagement in Afghanistan. It, remain, it remains my opinion that if there is culpability in this attack, it lies in policy decisions that created the environment of August 2021 in Kabul. Culpability and responsibility do not lie with the troops on the ground who perform magnificently. It does not lie with the platoon, company, or battalion commanders or the flag officers who oversaw operations on the ground in Kabul. The simple fact is this. On the battlefield, even with good planning, tremendous execution by brave people on the ground, the enemy sometimes has success. To ignore this fact is to ignore the fundamental reality of the battlefield. If there's fault, it lies in a policy decision that placed the joint force in this situation and exposed the force over time to the possibility of these kinds of attacks. We did not rely on the Taliban for our security. We used them as one tool among many to beef up our defensive posture. We avoided a number of potential Abbey Gate attacks, and I'm proud of the commanders and troops who prevented them. This is small comfort to those who lost loved ones, and I realize this. Nonetheless, what's remarkable about Kabul is not that the tragedy of Abbey Gate happened, but that many other attacks did not happen. I'll end my statement with this observation. I was the overall commander, and I and I alone bear full military responsibility for what happened at Abbey Gate. For the decision to set the date and to set the troop level to zero. Yes. yes. So he bears responsibility, not just you. That's correct. The outcome in Afghanistan was the cumulative effect of many decisions over many years of war. And like any complex phenomena, there's no single causal factor that determined the outcome, but multiple factors in combination. In the fall of 2020, as I previously testified publicly, my analysis, my personal analysis, was that an accelerated withdrawal would likely lead to the general collapse of the Afghan security forces and the Afghan government, resulting in a large-scale civil war reminiscent of the 1990s or a complete Taliban takeover. In November 2020, DOD received orders from the White House to reduce troop levels to 2,500 by January 15, 21. When the current administration took office in January 21, there were roughly speaking 2,500 U.S. troops on the ground with about 22,000 NATO troops and contractors. Beginning in February 21, the National Security Council conducted a 10-week interagency review of the Doha Agreement, and various options were presented and debated. In previous public testimony, I noted that at that time, my analysis based on my assessment and the recommendations of the commanders, to include General McKenzie, and the consensus of the Joint Chiefs of Staff was that we needed to maintain a minimum force of 2,500 troops on the ground, mostly special forces with allied troops and contractors in order to sustain the Afghan National Security Forces and its government until the diplomatic conditions of the Doha Agreement were met. Just days before the fall of Kabul and the evacuation of the embassy, August 14th is when they finally put forward this plan? Now that's when we got authority to execute the plan. That's when you got authority to, and you urged the White House and State Department to put pen to paper to develop a plan to get Americans and our Afghan al allies out of Afghanistan, correct? Yes, I did. In fact, uh, I was concerned by the middle of July. I was concerned about the different pace of Department of Defense planning as compared to Department of State planning. And I took an opportunity then to make representations to the secretary about my concern over that, the fact that we were moving pretty fast on this. Uh, they were not moving fast, and I was concerned that we were going to arrive at different locations just based on it. And, uh, and, and I rec went to the secretary. We spent some time uh, talking about that and actually followed up with a, written, with a written idea on some things that we could do. Sent a letter with 10 recommendations to the secretary of defense on that. And I, I think multiple things can be true. A lot of times in this town, we like to, it's an and or kind of deal, right? It's either Trump was responsible or Biden was responsible, right? I, I actually think in Afghanistan, it's an and and, quite frankly. Uh, I think there were mistakes made in the withdrawal. Uh, I think the American people think 
there were mistakes made in the withdrawal. And I, I think it's okay to admit that. I mean, what, what's the opposite of that? That the withdrawal was perfect? Everything went according to plan? Um, General Miller, do you think mistakes were made uh, in either the planning uh, phases, things that we thought were going to happen that didn't happen, or things on the ground that unfolded that it, we, didn't, we didn't plan for? You think, you think mistakes were made in all of the, that thought process? There's zero doubt in my mind there were mistakes made, and that's the point of the after action reviews. Identify those mistakes and develop solutions to implement them in the future. Um, and, and I think the fundamental mistake, fundamental flaw, uh, was the timing uh, of the State Department uh, call of the NEO. I think that was too slow and too late. Um, and that then caused a series of events that result in the, the very last couple of days. Number of Americans. Uh, that, this was always an issue. Uh, uh, the number of Americans, as General McKenzie said, an F-77 report is supposed to, every ambassador in every country of the world keeps an F-77 report, and they're supposed to track the, the Americans, where they're at, the phone numbers, address, et cetera, in the country. That was always a difficult number for us in the Department of Defense to get a hold of, and I think it's true at the tactical level as, and operational level as well. Uh, and I'll be candid. I don't know the exact number of Americans that were left behind because the starting number was never clear. Same is true of at-risk Afghans, SIVs, uh, the commandos, other Afghans that served with us. Uh, those numbers uh, varied so widely that they were quite inaccurate, uh, as, as best I could uh, tell at the time. Uh, so um, I, I would just say I'm not sure, even today, about the accuracy of all those numbers. Do you know where the Secretary of State was on August 13th, I, the day before Kabul fell? Do you know where the Secretary of State was? Despite all of your concerns, State Department wasn't planning fast enough. We weren't getting our people out. According to the Washington Post, he was in the Hamptons. He was in the Hamptons on vacation. Secretary of State Blinken. I don't know. I can't even imagine how that makes our Gold Star families feel. Look, here's the bottom line, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your indulgence. I'll, I'll close with this. The State Department, to use a military term, had its head up its rear. It wasn't planning. It, in fact, thought we could just have an embassy and the good, the good Taliban terrorists will take care of the bad Taliban terrorists. I mean, that's essentially what happened. And because of that, we didn't get our people out. We didn't get our citizens out. We didn't have the force posture. We, don't have, we didn't have the basing. We failed, and their loved ones are dead because of it. I quote, withdraw from Afghanistan, all military forces of the United States, its allies, coalition partners, including all non-diplomatic civilian personnel, private security contractors, trainers, advisors, and supporting service personnel. Is that correct? That was the Doha deal done under the Trump administration. Is that correct? As I recall, I think there were seven conditions that the United States signed up to and eight conditions that the Taliban signed up to. And I think you rattled off most of the key ones. It was a very explicit thing. It said you had to go from the, the there were 13,000 more or less, 13,000 U.S. troops uh, when Doha was signed, and then it was you had to go to 8,600 in 135 days. Let, let, let me just do this. This I want to make idea. sure. And so, therefore, the withdrawal was well underway in January 2021 after President Trump withdrew U.S. forces, notwithstanding concerns about the Taliban's behavior. Is that correct? The withdrawal was absolutely underway. The drawdown of forces was underway. That's correct. Had we not withdrawn, and not ended the war, would be, we be at open war with the Taliban? I think the probability is uh, greater than not that the Taliban would have reinitiated combat operations on 1 May or 2 May. The Doha Agreement says all force out by 1 May. The uh, current administration, the State Department negotiated with the Taliban to get that extended, Zal Khalizay did, to get that extended until uh, September, I guess it was, uh, to buy some additional time. But there's little question in my mind that had uh, the United States, at, at either president's agreement to withdraw, if we didn't withdraw 100 percent, then uh, we would have been back at war with the Taliban. That's right. To watch this entire hearing, download our free app C-SPAN now or visit cspan.org.